this Saturday, and uh, good morning, and maybe even good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world watching. Um, thank you so much for checking out the coffee and charts today. I don't have any coffee, but I've got some water. Uh, but hopefully you do, and have a nice uh, breakfast in front of you while checking this out. Today is really all about just looking at the broad markets, looking at the monthly closes for the entire uh, month of May, and seeing how that looks into uh, the summer. So uh, definitely sit back, relax, and uh, we have a lot of charts coming at you. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to do pretty much if you watch our weekend videos, I'm going to do the broad market update. I'm going to do SPY, the Q, the IWM, and then uh, we are going to go into the monthly charts of all those, and then we'll go into the monthlies of crypto, and then we'll go into the monthlies of some of the top charts that are generally requested on our Twitter, and then we'll open it up for requests. So you guys can kind of, you know, see how I do this live. And hopefully you guys ask for a couple charts that I haven't seen before, and it's just a blank screen and we'll kind of go off that. So um, to start off, we have SPY. Uh, and this is something that's really interesting across the board. If you look at the gaps, generally uh, for me personally, when I'm trading, I'm looking at gaps, whether they're above or below. Now, um, you know, when we were way down here in the middle of March, you could see that we had quite a few gaps above to fill. Um, we had one here, one here, so I can circle those here. This is where the gap snake highlights one, next one there, next one was here, but it did fill. So the main thing was we had these three gaps above. Um, and so the fact that all of the gaps have filled except one on SPY, is starting to make us kind of think, well, we now have four gaps below on SPY versus only having one gap above. So um, we are uh, hopefully going to integrate uh, this ratio. It's a ratio that I just came up with yesterday. Um, but really, it's important to know how many gaps there are above versus how many gaps there are below over, let's say, the last year because that can at least give you an idea of maybe what the bear targets are, what the bull targets are. So in this case, for SPY, we do have that gap above. Um, on Friday, you can see here that the raindrop was relatively strong, meaning that during the second half of the day here, you can see that there was volume being absorbed by buyers at the top of this range. So remember, a raindrop is a volume-based candle. You don't always you know, need to know what side of the volume was that? So, you know, when we teach this, a lot of people ask, well, how do you know if that wasn't selling volume or buying volume? The way to look at this is every share of volume is selling volume because somebody sold it. And every share of volume that's bought is buying volume. So technically they kind of cancel each other out. What we want to know is based on the volume profile of the raindrop, we want to know where that demand came in to actually absorb that selling or that supply. So in this case, we can see during the day, uh, in the second half of the day on Friday, there were buyers actually pushing the price up to new highs here. We know that the second half of the day created new highs because you can see on the left-hand side here, if I can get this kind of, see. Notice right here, it's flat. So that means that there was no volume at that location on the price range. So we know that this right-hand side is where that volume actually created that price. And so we could see that buyers were in control into the close. Um, it's pretty fascinating to see that uh, reversal after Trump's uh, uh, speech about uh, the WHO uh, getting out of the uh, World Health Organization. So, um, you know, is that going to just make people think that more money is going to come into the states and more? Money is going to go into uh, just the overall economy because we're going to start building stuff back at home. It seems like Trump is kind of really, you know, not happy with China right now. So it almost seems like the market took that as in we're bringing manufacturing another job home. That's the way I kind of saw it based on how the market responded. I mean, we were down. It, the market was going down like they thought World War Three was about to happen. And then right when the when the uh, conference was over, it ripped. And you can see those buyers actually really coming in during that second half of the day. So that is the daily side of things using the raindrop chart. We have four gaps below over the last two months on SPY. And we only have really one gap above for the entire 
life of SPY. Uh, this is the only gap that we do have above because before that we were at all time highs. Um, going into the weekly chart, you will see something really interesting here. What I've done is I've started a uh, kind of a broadening formation here. Remember that I always like to draw two lines. So in this case, we already have our first line. That's pretty much the top of this candle testing that. But then let's say that, you know, generally these are zones. And so what I like to do is I like to come in and add a second uh, parallel line here. And then we can see this is more of a zone rather than just to, uh, you know, a resistance line and a support line. We can do the same thing here. Remember, it doesn't need to be perfect. This is more of a line of best fit. But let's say that we also start another line here, connect it there. And now we have more of a zone rather than just, you know, two precise lines. So we now know that this is a zone below, this is a zone above, and we're pretty much trading right in the middle of this broadening uh, formation, uh, this uh, kind of megaphone pattern. So um, you can see that the price has finally broken out of this big chunk of volume here. So what I've done is I've started the volume profile, this vertical line. So this vertical line essentially says, I want to know from this point in time what the volume profile or volume by price looks like. So for me, I want to say, what is the volume by price? What is the distribution of shares within this megaphone pattern? And what you'll see is a majority of them were pretty much holding right in this area. And so this was kind of uh, a just a con uh, congestion area. You've got buyers trying to figure out if they're still buyers, sellers trying to figure out if they should you know, just sell because they're finally breaking even. And then finally, the price broke out, and now we have a lot of open air above, meaning that there's not a lot of supply zones above. Um, you know, there's these little supply zones, maybe around 310 to 312. There's another gap till about 320. Um, so, you know, that will be interesting to see if this just continues up. Um, the fact that so many people um, just seeing on Fintwit, it's almost like people are mad that the market's going up. Um, you know, I'm not celebrating, you know, the world in a very bad place, but, you know, the world's already in a bad place. Why would we want the market to not be going up either? So this is a classic don't fight the Fed type approach. I mean, I've been in situations in the past where I thought I was the smartest person in the world, uh, you know, watched the big short at least 10 times and then said, I'm going to short the market with everything I with everything I have. That didn't work out too well. And I've seen a lot of people do that this time around. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just something to think about is the Fed can remain uh, a lot more liquid than the majority, if not everyone, can remain solvent. So um, going into the queues, you know, we'll see something a little different here. I mean, the queues are just at a completely different spot um, in regards to FIBS, in regards to the gap. If you look at this current chart, there are no gaps above. Every single gap that was created on the way down was filled so this big gap everybody was really looking at and then finally it filled over the last couple of weeks and now we've got all these gaps below and uh remember if we look back in time look at this that was a gap below that was a gap below gap below gap below gap below we're pretty much in the same exact spot you know if you look at this uptrend it looks like Swiss cheese. You've got a but it's like if you've got a post, a post that you're trying to create a porch on or something, and you've got a bunch of termites and there's a bunch of holes in that post, it's it can't hold up very well. Eventually there's going to be enough weight where that post just collapses. So think of it like that, where you've got all of these essentially holes in price, all of these, i.e., these gaps. And so that is something that is definitely a lot of people are looking at. And uh you know, there's a lot of uncertainty coming in um, in the next six months. Is there going to be a second wave of Corona? You know, are these protests going to get to the point where, you know, this becomes a bigger deal than it is already? And it's only been less than a week. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that can kind of uh, really shake people right now. And but we do have to remember the Fed is there um, that, you know, not saying they weren't there before, but this is just like. Un unprecedented Fed action. So um, just hard to fight the Fed sometimes, but it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, shorting here would be wrong. You've got gaps below. There's a lot of different theses uh, for that bear 
that bear uh, research, but you know, the bulls also um, kind of have one too. SPY is lagging the queues. SPY can continue up. If we look, as we look at some of the charts into uh, the second half of this, looking at the monthly charts, you'll see that a lot of these companies can kind of be that second wave of, of buying coming in, or you can have rotation that also helps the market just continue to melt up. So that's the cues. Doesn't look a lot different from SPY. You've got a ton of gaps below. And remember, this is the gap snake that I'm using to identify these gaps. I didn't have to do this on my own. I just went to the indicator list and turned on gap snake. Um, remember that the indicators, manage indicators button is right next to that button, it's the three vertical line, uh, dots. And then you can just type in gap snake, it will pop up and then you're able to uh, see it here. And the one thing about the gap snake that's important is the gap factor. So 0.1 is the smallest factor, it's an ATR factor, average true range. Um, so over time, I'm sure we'll make this smaller. So if you do see that maybe a gap was missed, it's likely because it's just that small, the system's not picking it up. Uh, but this is incredibly powerful. It makes the whole process of finding these a lot more efficient. And uh, it's, it's really uh, something I've started to use quite a bit. Going into the uh, XBI chart here, pretty much the same thing. There are no gaps above for price to fill anymore. All of the gaps are below. Some of them are pretty big. Uh, so the one thing that, you know, bulls on the other side would say is, hey, you know, we did just break out of this uh, resistance area. We retested it pretty much textbook. And so what's the next move here? I mean, XBI did move up over 70 percent on this move up. So at what point do people say, OK, I'm, I'm taking some profits? I mean, <laughs> with the, the world the way it is very medically focused with all these vaccines trying to be created, you know, there can still be more demand here. I mean, uh, this is one of those uh, sectors that actually is benefiting from all this. So um, just something to keep in mind. Uh, IWM looks very similar to SPY. Um, it pretty much was rejected right at the uh, 0.618 FIB this week. We did break a little bit above it, but it did end up closing below. Um, and the same thing, you've got a ton of gaps below, but you also have this huge gap above. If we turn on the volume by price on the weekly chart, you'll see here that let's, let's anchor it from this 2018 high. You'll see that what happened was, and we were talking about this way down here, is you had this huge block of volume that essentially acted as a magnet for price. So notice the price pretty much just magnet, magnet mode right up to this area because this is where a majority of the shares are holding. As soon as supply dries up and people stop panic selling and any type of demand increases, you're pretty much going to magnet mode back to this equilibrium point of control um, distribution area. So um, notice here that uh, you know even though this looks not great, the, uh, the gap did almost fill below here and now uh you know we'll have to see what happens i mean it's it's i have no idea what's gonna happen no one ever knows what's gonna happen but this is a time where everyone's just like what the heck is going on the market's ripping you know other things are coming out of left field so um this is definitely a crucial point um but just from my experience, it's always been interesting to see the market does like to melt up into the 4th of July um, and beyond. Um, but uh, moving on, let's go to uh, some of these monthly charts. So these were the daily charts versus the weekly charts. Let's go to the monthly charts. So this is SPY, and this is a really cool uh, statistic here. You, you, So what I did here is I started the very high, like in, in March of 2000, the very high here. And then I started in uh, October of 2007 at the very high. And all I did was I measured how long it took for the price to move down as much as it did over the last three months. So we, we went top all time highs to the low of negative 35.6% in less than two months. If you look at the dot-com bubble, which was historically the huge crash, 
it took 26 months for the the very high all-time high to hit a low of uh 36%. Actually, I take that back. It was here. That's my apologies. So I think this was closer to uh one year and seven months. So sorry, nine about 19 months there. Regardless, almost two years on uh, during the dot-com bubble. And uh remember this this was 35.6%. So yes, this bottomed out right around here. That over. So so yeah, you've got this pretty much taking literally 26 months, and then you've got this one taking about 13 months, and then you've got this that took less than two months. So I'm not saying that the market can't go down. I mean, this could easily you know pull one of these. But is, is it like probable? The thing that a lot of people forget is when interest rates are at zero or pretty much, pretty much zero, where else are you going to put your money? I mean, you're going to get a higher return on a dividend yield most of the time just putting it in a stock. So the fact that the only place to really put your money at this point is the stock market there's so much liquidity right now. I mean, I know I know my friends right now who um, you just got their stimulus check or, you know, maybe they're unemployed and they're making more money than they were while they were employed. That's liquidity right there. Guess where they're putting their money? The stock market. They're like, oh, how do I trade? So, you know, um, yes, a lot of retail people are getting in and sometimes that can kind of say, all right, are we nearing a top? Because, uh, you know, a lot of people are starting to play this again. But there's just so much liquidity right now. I really think you'd have to, in my opinion, doesn't matter at all. But my general thought would be is if there's so much money floating around, you know, you, it's hard for the market to go down. The reason why the market was able to go down so quickly here is because you pretty much had literally a credit freeze, like a liquidity freeze. Like the credit markets just literally went, literally froze. So, um, you know, as far as where we're at now, the market already knows a second wave is probably coming. The market already knows that like all of these th the elections are coming. Does that mean it can't go down? No, but you always have to remember the biggest crashes happen when the market, it literally comes out of left field. Nobody knew about coronavirus in, uh, in uh, November. Um, it wasn't even known that that was a thing. So when the second wave comes now, at least people at least know what coronavirus is. They know what it, you know, what the the implications are of getting it, you know. So it's a completely different status quo if we do have that second wave. I just don't think you're going to get that crash like you did here. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. Um, if I was right uh, all the time, then um, I'd probably be on an island somewhere. But um, so that is SPY on a monthly chart. Just really unbelievable how big of a move we had to the upside. And I think that just goes to show how much liquidity there is out there right now. Going into the queues, um, no issues here, hitting new all-time uh, highs, at least from a monthly perspective. What I've done here is I've done a measured move um, pretty much from the, uh, the 2000 high to the 2002 low and pretty much are using the fibs. And honestly, I got to admit, fibs are something that I never really used that much before and uh after really uh working more with jc peretz uh working with uh tarek saab who is at fib fib levels or at fib lines on twitter he really taught me about the 0.618 and uh you know that's something jc really loves to use as well and it's just it's one of those things where if you're hitting new highs that is pretty much the only forecaster that you can really go off of sometimes. So in this case, we've got this measure move. We tested this, uh, the original uh, 1.618 extension and really pretty much uh, traded around it as a line of best fit for some time, even up until the last month. And now we're kind of, you know, are we going to pretty much melt up to this 2.618? Uh, the next extension, who knows? We'll to see. But the beautiful thing about this is, I don't necessarily need to be exactly right, right? I don't need to know, is the price going to hit exactly at 283.50? 
what I can do is I can create sensitivity areas, which will increase. And you can see that now I have a zone rather than just, you know, a, a, an exact price. So this allows me to kind of have some margin of error around these areas. So in this case, I want to know anytime the four hour chart touches this purple area and I'll just put it for 99 days of past because this is a monthly chart. If this took four months, then that's literally over, over the expiration period. So um, alerts created. If this did happen to continue up, I wouldn't necessarily need to open up this chart again. The system would uh, just alert me through my phone or email when it happens. Uh, so going into the next one, XBI, this is another one that's really, uh, you know, breaking out, if anything, uh, especially on the monthly candle here. You can see that we did close above this previous high from June of 2018. Uh, we did technically close above it, but there is that wick up here. This is something that I'm really excited about because we are going to, at some point, have the monthly and the weekly raindrops. So this is like, this is the exact time where I would pull up a raindrop because I want to know, is there volume in this, uh, in this uh, wick? So for example, if I go to Amazon, this was a cool example uh, on the daily candle uh, last week or the week before, same type of thing though. You can see here, this is on the daily candle. It's slightly, you know, it's a slightly different type of uh, example, but it's the same type of thing where we've got a horizontal level Turn this off, turn this off. All right, so this was a previous high. And so what we could see here with the raindrop is, is we can actually see where that volume, where those shares were being absorbed around this breakout zone. So here you could tell that there were buyers definitely absorbing any supply that was being put on the market here. And that's how, uh, you know, it was very easy to see that this this had that continuation up. Where did this continue up to uh, after this breakout? Interesting, you asked. Right to the 1.618 Fib level, to the almost to the uh, cent, you know, almost to the dollar. I think it was like like five bucks off. But uh, the point is, is this is an exact way to use the fibs, and this is something that I really. Uh, stumbled into uh, after working with our partners who use FIB levels. And it's just amazing, you know, what you can see with these things and how much the, re the market just respects them. The, the 0.618 extension or retracement is simply just pretty much a self-fulfilling prophecy in the market because so many people look for that uh, type of action. So I'm um, here, notice how much, how much information I can get here. So then when we go to the monthly chart, on XBI, you'll see here why it would be a big deal to have that monthly chart. We want to know what's going on in that volume or going in, what is the volume situation going on in that wick? Um, so I, you know, I'm counting down the days till that comes out because this would be really important to know um, into next week. So um, going on and moving on to some of, uh, some of those uh, that's, love the VIX still right now. Uh, this is a really interesting case study here that we uh, that I drew up, uh, I guess last month. And it was, uh, you know, I didn't short, you know, I didn't short the mark or sorry, I didn't short the VIX or anything like that. You know, I prefer to just look, look at the markets and look what's lagging in them, like your GEs and your Deltas and your United Airlines. But um, anyways, so you can see here that, uh, you know, we had this huge, huge gap up, opened way above the previous uh, high in March, and then just absolutely engulfed the entire body of the March candle, and then continued down this month. Um, if you look at times when this happened at these uh, bikes before, notice how the VIX generally melted down after that. I mean, it did, it wasn't like right away, but you can see that the VIX is generally you know, not necessarily spiking too much after that. Um, so will it happen again like that? Who knows? But I mean, if you highlight all of these different situations where the VIX was elevated above pretty much like 25 and this happened, you generally had a decent move down for a few months. 
Um, however, this is a pretty big move down. You know, maybe this is just going to be one of those like, you know, spike up, down type of deals here and back up. I have no idea what's going to happen, but um, I'm sure there are some people banking on that uh, or at least betting on that possibly happening. Uh, so that is VIX. Uh, and, you know, from from a perspective of just, you know, previous moves, we are still pretty much at these recent high or sorry, these these peak highs here, which is now acting as support for the VIX before this was the highest the VIX really had ever um, hit since our uh, since the uh, issue we had in 2012 with the Europe crisis, and then obviously in 2008 2009. But uh, just interesting to see that all of these previous areas that we all um, were considered just really high areas for VIX is now literally support after like a, almost a 50% move down. So the VIX is just a fascinating one to, to watch, but um, it is one that uh, it can be quite dangerous. Going into the last one for the monthly charts, at least for the broad markets, you can see here that we've got IYT. This is the transportation average uh, ETF. And uh, you can see here what I've done with the anchored VWAP is, this is something that Brian Shannon teaches. And it's, it's pretty simple, right? All I'm doing is I'm anchoring the VWAP from this March 2009 low. The next time that price capitulates and catches a catches a bid at this anchored VWAP, this candle is when I start a new anchored VWAP. So from there, notice at two, how perfectly the anchored VWAP worked right here. So now as the price drops, it's kind of like handing off a baton uh, or what, baton or battalion? I don't know, that's not, <laughs> but either way you're passing it on. Uh, so so you've got this, uh, this bounce here at the anchored VWAP. And then you've got another anchored VWAP that you create. And then literally that acted as support. And now literally you've got this almost acting as resistance this month. So it's only three lines. It's essentially telling us what is the average price per share traded since the bottom or since the test of the, re the other anchored VWAP. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that Brian Shannon at Alpha Trends teaches um, and he is really the master at this and the pro, but uh, he has taught us how to use it as well. And, uh, you know, it's something that's completely changed the way I trade and the way that I view the market. So um, definitely check it out. The beautiful thing about this that nobody else has, everybody, you know, has the uh, anchored view app in some form, or at least people are starting to get there. But the nice thing about the uh, anchored view app for TrendSpider is notice that this particular anchored view app did not, was not tested in, uh, in March, 2020. However, if I go and create an alert on this line and add sensitivity to it, notice what I was able to do with uh, the TrendSpider platform. I was essentially able to capture that margin of error around the anchored VWAP, which gave me the ability to not have to be precisely on the money. I have the ability to be off by upwards of $8.50 here and still get the alert. So, um, you know, that is something that you won't find on any other platform, the ability to add that sensitivity to um, any anchor view app, any trend line, any moving average. And that really gives you a lot more flexibility than um, something else that may not necessarily um, say, all right, well, you know, I'll, we'll give you a target, but not necessarily a cushion. So that is something that is proprietary to TrendSpider and we're uh, very proud of. So, um, Going on to some cryptocurrency, not sure how many uh, viewers on here do look at crypto, but I think it's starting to get more and more relevant. I mean, it's really something that a lot of people watch. It's, you know, possibly something to uh, look at when you're comparing possibly fighting inflation versus owning gold. We did a survey recently and uh, Bitcoin, uh, what was it like? what would you wrap, what's going to appreciate more in the next six months or something? And Bitcoin was pretty close to being first. And it just shows that, you know, people are definitely uh, not ignoring this. This isn't going away, uh, which a lot of people, you know, eventually said it would. And who knows, maybe it still will. But um, what I've done here is I've anchored the volume by price from this capitulation point in uh, March of 2017. This is pretty much when Bitcoin went from like a thousand down to uh, pretty much like that 
that flash that every everyone had. Ethereum had it. It was just a weird flash crash. But I, that's that was a very important event in crypto history. So that's why I want to start the volume profile from it. What's the status quo of the shares or just the distribution of shares since this status quo change? And you can see here since 2017, you'll see that you've got this massive base forming. So this all of this volume right here, this is all where the shares are currently holding. So let's say the price moves up really strong up to here and you've got a bunch of people take their profits here, but then you've got even more people coming in and buying that supply. You'll see this morph into maybe, uh, maybe you'll have a couple blocks like this. Um, so like, for example, here, you may have something like this form over the next couple months here. If we got a big move up, because what happens is all of this supply has to be distributed somewhere. Um, there's a set, there's a finite amount of coins for Bitcoin. So these have to go somewhere. So as the price goes up, these will, this volume will then be distributed at a higher point. And this is how you sometimes will see how the price will kind of stair step up these areas. So um, that's something to keep in mind. This volume by this volume profile, volume by price um, does change over time. Just because there's a volume base forming here now doesn't mean if we move up that this volume base may move up with the price because those shares then have to be distributed up to a new level as those people take profits from down here. So um, that is Bitcoin. I mean, if you look at any of the coins, though, Ethereum, you got pretty much the same exact setup here. You've got literally this massive just volume base forming here. And what I've done is I've anchored the volume by price from, oh, come on, there we go. I've anchored the volume by price from this capitulation candle, pretty much what we just talked about for Bitcoin, except it happened in May for Ethereum. And then you can see what I've also done is I've anchored that volume weight, volume weight average price from this top candle in December of 2017. Notice here, same thing. We, the price has never hit this area the last two times we moved up. But if you would have been able to create this sensitivity zone here, let me move this over a little bit. You would, you would see that, you know, the sensitivity is you're able to capture those wicks. So you wouldn't have necessarily been able to capture that one. The reason why this, uh, this purple area kind of gets bigger down here is because this is a log scale. So it's just the math behind the, the chart. So that's why it's getting bigger over time. But um, notice here, you would have been able to capture this uh, wick here within the alert system. So uh, that sensitivity is something that uh, really comes in handy. So same thing, Ethereum, we've got just this massive base forming in price. And then if we go to LTC USD, which is just Litecoin, go to the uh, weekly candle here. I mean, look at this volume shelf forming. If you just, I mean, you can do it from, generally I like to do it from like a really hot, a recent high. So like maybe the, uh, the June 2019 high. Look at how much volume is holding here. It's pretty much creating a shelf for the price. If I anchor the Alpha Trends anchored view app from this uh, February 2020 high and this March 2020 low, you'll see that the price has pretty much just been ping-ponging back and forth between these two equilibrium prices. And then as either, okay, you can either have supply dry up and the demand remains constant, that will drive the price up. So you actually don't need to have more buyers to drive the price up. You just need to have people stop selling. Um, if demand remains constant and supply decreases relative to that, you can get a move up. You can also get supply decreasing and demand increasing which is generally going to give you a stronger move up. Um, so those are the two things that can happen from a supply and demand zone here. And, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see maybe what causes that um, in, the, in the next couple of weeks. So remember, this is the weekly chart. We did switch over and you can just see how defined that volume shelf is, how many people are pretty much holding it break even here since this 2019 high. Last one that I'm going to go over is uh, Link. So Chainlink, USD. Um, this is a favorite by some of my friends. Um, so shout out to Alex. Um, if he's watching, he, he loves this thing. Uh, but I mean, 
it is forming quite a base here. If you look at where all of the shares are holding pretty much since this point in time on Fe in mid-February of 2020, notice that a lot of those shares are holding right at this zone here. So even though the price has gone from 4.9 all the way down to 1.52, you can see over that span of price range, a majority of the shares are still holding near the top of that range. And you can see that there's clearly demand at this area, and that's why price is holding here. So will the price break out and kind of break off, uh, break out of this base that's forming? Um, we'll have to see. But it is it is something that bulls would want to see for this this volume to be supporting price at these highs. So um, that is uh, the last one I'm going to go over on crypto. I'm going to go over a few different monthly charts on Facebook. Tesla, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, Shopify, NVIDIA, Delta, United Airlines, General Electric, and uh, Southwest Airlines. So um, those are the ones I'm going to go over. If we have time, um, I will do chart requests pretty much live, and uh, we'll have Brad tell me what those are, and we'll go from there. But let's, uh, let's knock out these charts. What time is it? 9.36, so we have about 20 more minutes. Um, I think we could probably get through some. So uh, going into the uh, the monthly charts, you know this this is always important to look at the monthly charts. A lot of people, a lot of smart people are looking at the monthly charts this weekend. It's just kind of a natural thing to do at the end of the month uh, when those candles close. So what I've done here is I've I've pretty much shown that we've got this uh, kind of ascending ascending wedge type looking uh, candle here. It's it's very subtle, but what I've done as well is I've done a measured move from this point up here to this point down here. I did just get rid of those two lines because they were uh, kind of polluting the chart. But if you did want me to add them, that's what they look like. This is just your uh, one. This is your zero for the measured move on the fib. And then we've got this 1.618 extension above. So if we just get rid of that and kind of keep the chart a little cleaner. You'll see that you know this 1.618 may be an area above to to take a look at. Uh, we'll just have to see. Uh, and this is this is probably out of all of the charts that I've seen on the monthly candle. This is one that I really really want to be able to see that monthly raindrop. Same thing, right? Look, we closed right at resistance, but look at how much of that wick moved intra month. Um, through that resistance, I want to see if there were if there was any volume supporting price above this trend line, and I just can't see that without the raindrops. So being able to have those monthly raindrops is going to be a huge, huge feature and uh, addition to the platform um, because right now we can only go up to daily. But being able to see those monthly raindrops is going to be uh, really crucial, especially for these types of breakouts where we technically broke out intra month, but we did close right at resistance. Um, so that is uh, Facebook. Tesla is a really cool example here of really just using, you know, some simple patterns here. So all we've done is we've highlighted this previous area back in uh, 2010 to 2013, this, uh, this horizontal resistance. Finally, we broke out and this thing just absolutely ripped. Well, if you look at kind of what's happened over the last uh, year, we pretty much had a very similar setup here. We had this uh, pretty much three year area of resistance, horizontal resistance, finally broke out. In this particular case, we did actually retest this area of resistance, which you know I think a lot of uh, people who look at charts would tell you that's what they would prefer rather than not testing it. Uh, but then notice how much this wick just got bought up and we went pretty much straight back up. And if you look here, notice how similar this candle is. We've got this big impulse candle here, big impulse candle here, and then you've got this inside uh, month here, pretty much closing right within this previous month's wick. And so, if you look at what happened the next month, this thing just, or the next three months, this thing just skyrocketed higher. Um, so, for those that are really bullish on Tesla, you know that would be something to add to the thesis. Is just this inside month. You've got a ton of consolidation and just kind of overall action.
option here for shares to be distributed to new hands, creating a volume base, and then a move up. Um, so that is something to definitely check out. If you do anchor the volume by price from this original breakout, notice what happened here. When we pulled back, look where the price bounced, right at this volume shelf. So this, this really acts as like a stair step. Like if you go to step on something, you want to make sure that is supported by something under that step. You don't want to have a step that's got, you know, back to the termite example, a bunch of termites and you just step and you step right through it and you go into the, the, the floor below you. Um, so you really want to have that, that volume there to create that hard step that you can bounce off of or, or leverage off of with your foot if you want to compare it to stepping off of it. Um, moving on to Amazon. This thing, I mean, come on, really? I mean, this thing is just unreal. But when you've got a company like Amazon that just absolutely dominates pretty much everything at this point, that's the kind of chart that you're going to see here. So um, notice that we've literally just been bouncing along this area of support for the last 20 years, um, believe it or not. Every time that I highlight a uh, orange circle, we either tested this line or got very close to it. And then, uh, you know, notice that we finally broke through this, uh, this two years of horizontal resistance. And then we, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen here. If you did want to maybe use that Fibonacci approach, uh, some people, you know, may be looking at this measured move as your, your one to measure from. So in this case, you know, this, it, I mean, you can't make it up. Literally, we, we hit that 1.6 weight exactly on the dot, which we had mentioned before um, when we went over the daily chart on Amazon. But I mean, it's just another example here showing it um, with the monthly chart. So if we break through this, would the 2.618 be the, the next logical area? Maybe. Um, but, you know, this thing is, this thing is uh, rather strong. But uh, does it mean that this can't come back to retest this uh, resistance? Absolutely not. I mean, if you look at Tesla, that's exactly what Tesla did before moving higher. So uh, we'll just have to see if that happens on Amazon as well. Going on to Apple, you know, Apple doesn't go down. So uh, clearly clearly almost at new all-time highs again. Uh, just kidding, it does go down, but doesn't seem for uh, like for very long. So in this case, I pointed out this area on this broadening formation, this uh, resistance area here would be new all-time highs around 390. However, remember, trend line, anytime you're doing a price target on a trend line, you have to remember that trend line is a function of price. So sure, if next month's candle went straight up 390 would be resistance but let's say that you know we do one of these like you know and we don't go straight up this this next area could be at 410 so just remember that this trend line is a function of time so as time goes on these resistance zones move upwards as well and you know this was my uh example of just uh kind of like uh candles moving up so notice this would be three more months. So if this thing did take three months to move up, that would be your resistance at 410. If the monthly candle literally just went straight up next month, then that's when your resistance would be at around 391, at least on this resistance line. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, but yeah, Apple, we're pretty much in this broadening formation. If this previous high breaks right around this uh, 328, I can't see this not trying to retest that zone. Um, so we'll just have to see. One thing that we could do, as always, just do those FIB levels. Notice how this 1.618 it intersects right around 400 um, with this uh, this resistance area. So you know something to something to just look at. But um, moving on, Netflix. Netflix is one that has not. Uh, you know, done what Amazon did, which it looks very similar on the chart, at least for the last about 10 years. Uh, and what I did was I pretty much just started the support line from after we did, made this big move up. This is pretty much when this trend started, or at least kind of became a little less, uh, 
you know, just straight up, it, it just kind of followed this nice gradual line up. And then finally, uh, we tried to break through that area uh, and then just did not, just didn't do it here. Um, this is another reason why I would love to have these monthly raindrops here. And that's why um, we're really going to push the dev team to get those out, hopefully in the next couple months. Um, who knows, maybe uh, they can do some magic and get it out sooner. But um, this, this is something that could really help those uh, long, even like investors, investors who are investing in fundamentals, they still need to know on the chart exactly what's going on. So even if you're just looking at the monthly chart, um, this is where the raindrops would really come in handy. Uh, so that is Netflix. We'll have to see what happens there. You know, clearly two months in a row, just a hard resistance zone. So uh, we'll, we'll have to see what goes on into, uh, into the summer. Going into Google, and this is pretty much taking care of Fang at this point. Very similar kind of setup here. You've got this megaphone. Uh, resistance is same thing, a function of time. So if this went straight up next month, maybe we topped out around 1600. If this took, you know, oops, if this took six months, you'd probably be somewhere closer to like 1700. So it's just a function of how long it takes to get to this point, which would give you, you know, where you would consider a price target at this level, or at least at using this trend line. Uh, so that is Google. As you can see, all of the tech companies are not really having trouble getting back to where they were trading literally three months ago. Uh, Shopify is having no trouble uh, getting to uh, Mars before Elon Musk. Um, if you can see here, the volume by price is essentially starting here because this was pretty much where we capitulated before the next move higher. Notice what happened over the last couple months here. There's our volume shelf, which acts as a launch pad for price a lot of the time. Remember, I'm anchoring the volume by price and the anchored VWAP from this point because this is where we capitulated in 2018, in December of 2018. This was our previous bear market, if you want to call it that, um, uh, but it wasn't, But or at least maybe in the broad markets for a second it was or something. But, um, you know, this was at least the bottom point before we did make that, that horizontal breakout um, here on in February of 2019. So uh, that's why I decided to anchor it from that point. I do like to also anchor from these breakout points. Brian Shannon also taught me this and notice how beautifully the price really just trades right along it. And so using pretty much two of these in conjunction really work nicely as well. I like to use them kind of like two parallel lines. So, uh, so that is something just, you know, that is invaluable on the platform, not only being able to anchor the volume way to average price, but being able to say, what is the volume profile? What is the distribution of shares since this bottom? A lot of the time, you don't have that option. You either have to put in that date manually or generally, this is just a function of how far out you are on the chart. So the, the ability to localize this point and say, I wanna know what the, the, the distribution of shares is since this bottom is, uh, is incredibly powerful in another way that's really changed the way that, that I trade. And, I've been trading for a long time. I originally started out when I was 12, traded a lot in the 2008, 2009 crisis. And honestly, I wasn't using anything except a, a line chart and just looking at trend and seeing, okay, is it going up? Are people talking about it on some random uh, message board that has nothing to do about this company? You know, and so, you know, that's how I started. So being able to kind of get back to that because I did use a lot of lower indicators. I still like to use divergence like the Williams percent range as a lower indicator, but just using volume and price and just you know raw supply and demand is really at the end of the day what's driving price. So um, just, a, just a cool example here on shop. NVIDIA, uh, let's see what we got here on the monthly. We've just got this massive, massive, or we'll go to the weekly here. Just this huge rounded uh, bottom breakout that finally broke out. I'll turn off the uh, volume by price here, and you'll just see that you know this is getting a little overheated. This this literally went up uh, uh, 184 up to 365 in about nine weeks. 
Uh, that is insane. Um, but that's what happens when you have a lot of liquidity out there that needs to have somewhere to be, you know, to put that money. So um, this is clearly maybe getting a little exhausted. I mean, if you want to look at a hanging man and what that looks like as a textbook example, I'd say that's probably it. Um, so clearly sellers came in, they were able to move the price down, fill this gap below. So is this kind of the nail in the coffin here, at least on the weekly? We'll have to see, but uh, man, that's ugly. Uh, going into the next one, Delta, United Airlines, Southwest, all of these are going to be looked at on the monthly chart um, and the weekly. I'll go over uh, an example there in a second. But pretty much what I've done here is I went on the linear chart and I simply just, let me get this a little better. Okay, so um, what I did here was I essentially just started here, connected here, and that was an extended ray. And this this is a linear chart. Um, you know, generally linear charts, especially with this type of price action, are looked at as you know maybe not the best to use because of uh, the way the scale is. Because remember, if I go to log here, it changes because now a dollar move at forty is different from a dollar move at six bucks. However, what you can do on Trendspire, which is really nice, is actually literally just uh, turn on log and your linear, um, your linear uh, line is then turned into log scale. So you can see here, we pretty much just uh, turn this into log and then we're able to see um, literally almost a perfect bounce here. But the main thing is if we anchor the VWAP from this point in time, Notice how we actually are still closing below that March 2009 anchor VWAP, which, um, you know, may be looked at as possibly bearish. So um, that is something to keep in mind. This has closed. Um, this is now one, two, three, four, five red months. However, this particular doji, we did have a little bit of bullishness just simply because um, we do have a hollow candle here. So here... This, this doji, we opened at 26, we closed at 25.87, and so it's, it's red. Now this, we closed at 25.87, then we opened down here at 24.92, closed at 25.21. That is why this is still red, because we technically still closed below this. The reason why this is hollow and this is solid is because in this case, you opened at 24.93 and you closed at 25.21. So technically from the open to the close, buyers were in control, at least from a price standpoint. Um, so it's like if you're closing the shades, your opens up here, your closes down here, you're closing the shades. That's where you're going to get a solid candle. If your opens down here and your close up here, you're opening the shades and that's where you're going to get your hollow candle. So, uh, so that is Delta. Going on to United Airlines, this is one of my favorite case studies using the anchored volume by price. If you start the volume by price from this low here in, yeah, July of 2009, I started it here. Technically, we hit a low in July of 2008 lower, but this was technically your lowest open. So that's why I anchored it from here. Notice what we have here a ton of volume holding here. So that's why price was able to literally go down here and stop because you had a very strong kind of, remember we're talking about stair steps. You wanna step on something that's got something supporting it behind you, below you. Um, and so that is, that is like your concrete step, step there. Uh, price has literally bounced off this three different months in a row um, and the wicks on this thing are insane. Um, so, at, from this perspective, you know, it's really hard to see what's going to happen. Uh, nobody really knows. But for the price to go below this block of volume, this demand zone, is uh, would be rather hard because you'd really have to have a lot of supply. You'd have to have a lot of people selling at a loss for the price to drop more. Remember, up here, most people were not holding at a at a profit. Most people were holding here. So this big chunk of of supply, you know, or sorry, this big chunk of volume here that was your demand zone was up 330%. So as the price dropped, 
people sell, they take their profits. And then once the price gets here, nobody can sell anymore from this big block of volume because they don't have any more profits to sell. They, they, the, the supply dries up and then you know demand doesn't even have to move up. It just can remain constant. And if supply dries up enough, you get these bounces. So um, what will happen in the future into the rest of the, the summer and beyond, I think is really just dependent on how the overall culture is changed by this for however long it takes. And if people even want to fly, I mean, my mom used to fly literally three times a week and uh, they're telling her she's likely not going to even fly until next year. So you have to think if there's a lot of people out there that are like my mom who still travel a lot for business, that business demand is a lot of the demand in the airline industry. Those people just traveling a lot. So, uh, you know, you got that. These companies don't want to be sued, so they're not going to put their workers in, you know, a position where they could get the virus. And then people who are traveling for just recreational, you know, stuff probably don't want to travel, one, maybe because they don't want to get the virus. But two, if you go travel somewhere, it's not going to be like visiting it. It's pretty much a closed down place wherever you're at. I guess if you're in Florida, it's, it's pretty much kind of open and other places are opening. But in Colorado, I wouldn't say come here, nothing is open. So um, just a heads up for that. But, uh, you know, that is that is the thesis on the airlines. I mean, your, your Boeing Airlines as well, your GEs of the world, they're all pretty much looking exactly the same because they're all pretty much, um, you know, they have the same type of uh, business model that's around aviation and not business model, but the same type of you know, product that they're working on aviation, whether that's engines or, um, you know, airplanes. So, you know, it's not shocking to see that this looks very similar to United Airlines and Delta for the monthly candles here. Um, so uh, GE, pretty similar as well. GE, you've got um, a little different here. You've actually got really lower lows here. Uh, and so this is where I would maybe pull out divergence, pull out RSI in the Williams percent range. And, you know, it's really interesting to see the fact that the price has really been moving to lower lows here. But if you look at the, the percent range, we're, we're actually at higher lows still. This doesn't mean that this can't go down and, and pretty much break divergence. But until that happens, you do have to keep your eye on the fact that, you know, we are at a higher area here. And if this did reverse, that would be divergence kind of kicking in. Now, one thing with GE that I want to mention, if we start the volume profile from the top here, notice how much volume is at 10 bucks. I mean, you literally have all of this volume pretty much acting as a magnet above, very similar to what we talked about in IWM earlier today. So is this going to be the next thing that you kind of have this magnet that moves or the price moves up because this kind of point of control around 10 bucks? is a magnet above. If you go to the daily and you go, uh, you turn on the gap snake that I've highlighted already, um, you can see all of these gaps above that are that are still there. And you can see if you start this from the February highs, most of the volume is holding here. It's gonna be hard for the price to drop any lower without people starting to sell at a loss from this big chunk of volume here. So um, that is uh, that is a lot of charts and a lot of talking that I just did. So uh, sorry if uh, that puts you to sleep, but that is a decent overview of the broad markets, pretty much all of the main stocks people are watching. I'm sure I missed some. So that's why I am going to open it up for some suggestions uh, to, uh, to take a look at some charts right now live. And Brad, just let me know what we're looking at uh, for, for that type of uh, thing. Hey, Jake. Um, okay. So we're looking at AMGN. Engine. Yeah, we'll do that one first. All right. Ooh. All right. Daily chart. Let's do the monthly first and we'll kind of go down from there. So uh, let's do. All right. So Amgen clearly has been in an uptrend. There's a few ways that you could anchor the volume profile. For me personally, I am going to anchor the volume profile from pretty much where we capitulated before we broke out. So notice here, we had uh, this kind of resistance zone. We finally broke out. You can either anchor it 
and this is preference, right? And you, there's not a place you have to anchor from. For me, and this is how Brian taught me how to anchor, it, you can anchor from the actual breakout, which is, uh, you know, showing quite the volume shelf here. Or if you wanted to anchor from this capitulation point before the breakout, you'll see that the volume profile is really not going to change much. From 2011, most of the shares are still, well, it's pretty much tied. Most of the shares are holding around the uh, 160 area. And then you've got a big block of shares also holding uh, in the 70s. So um, that is Amgen. If we go to a daily chart, I do like to always turn on the gap snake. Notice something different with Amgen. There are no gaps below. So, you know, is Amgen going to be a, a, a vaccine play or a, just a biotech play in general? I'm not, I know Amgen's in kind of the biotech. I'm not sure if they would do vaccines, but, you know, it clearly shows that we caught some, we caught some, uh, some bids here. Likely, let's anchor the VWAP here. Look where we caught a bid, right at the anchored VWAP. A lot of the time, you don't even need to anchor this. You just know that that's where it is. And so um, I guarantee if you look at a lot of the breakouts recently, or sorry, the, break, uh, the pullbacks from the original breakouts, those pullback bottoms are going to be at that anchored VWAP, either from the March bottom or let's say from uh, a breakout candle like this, which uh, is now you know, pretty much going to be your resistance above. So remember, this is why I do this. This was pretty much a previous area of resistance for a lot of wicks and bodies here. Next up, you got Roku. We finally closed above this, and notice what happens. If we anchor the VWAP here, it acted as support beautifully before we finally broke down, and now it's acting as resistance here. So, um, you know, don't want to spend too much time on Amgen, but uh, that was a great uh, request. Thank you for whoever... Uh, requested that because that's a really cool case study on on some of these roku going into next week is an example of one that does have a gap below um this is uh one that i actually did personally i was just personally trading it and um i originally got in right around uh the 110 down to 108 and then we kind of flushed here and i got flat i got uh stopped out but I was fine with that because, I mean, if you look at this gap below, I, I, I personally would rather enter after the gap is filled. That's just kind of my, my strategy. That doesn't mean that that's the right thing to do. But um, you can see that we did kind of flush and close below this anchored view app here from the March 17th low. And so that was also a little bit of a kind of a red flag. But um, does, that not mean, does that mean that this can't absolutely rip? to this uh, area above? No, uh, this generally will act as kind of a, a magnet above. Notice that you've also got your Alpha Trends anchored VWAP right below this big shelf here. And remember, this volume shelf is now supply because all of these shares holding at this zone around 125, these shares are holding at a loss. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, yeah, that was my dog. Hey, no worries. I thought someone was getting <laughs> killed. Um, uh, so anyways, uh, you've got your area here um, that is going to act as supply because as we get back up to the zone, this is where people are going to break even and they're like, okay, I'm out. And any increase in supply from those people selling to break even will cause the price to take a little bit of a, you know, a timeout, if you will. And then this is the ultimate area where price needs to break through in order to kind of get above this, create a base and then move higher. Uh, so that's Roku. Uh, let's look at it on the monthly real quick as well. Um, I was gonna talk about this one and I forgot to ask, so thank you again for this one. Uh, this is one of those ones that's really interesting as well. If you, if you anchor the volume by price from pretty much the IPO candle here, you'll see that we really re were rejected right at this supply zone up here. Notice that there wasn't a lot of volume here. So that's why price was able to move pretty freely over these last three months from literally 7, uh, 58 to 140. Um, and uh, look at how nicely that the price bounced off this, uh, this demand zone here. So um, that is something to keep in mind. Um, obviously, it's way down here, but it's always interesting to see. Remember, if the price is above this area, 
This is the demand zone because this is where buyers previously were. These people or these shareholders are holding at a profit here. These people, i.e. the supply, and that's why we call it supply because they're holding at a loss, is up here. So, um, you know, this, this was a pretty cool example on the monthly of this kind of ping ponging between the supply and demand zone. I think we have time for, let's say, two or three more. Brad, which, which ones do we got? Okay, next up we got KO. Ooh, nice. Coca -Cola. And then uh, we'll move into GLD as our last one. Oh, like it. Beautiful. Okay, so KO is uh, really a cool case study on the weekly here. I mean, if you are looking for like one of those examples of a volume shelf forming, that is it. I mean, Coca-Cola is one of those things. Obviously, they have a lot of restaurants. Uh, I mean, every anything that's closed down right now pretty much sells Coca-Cola. So it makes sense that this is down. But you have to also think of all the people that have bought Coke at just store, not like Coca-Cola at stores. And, uh, you know, like they, that that's demand that likely wasn't there before. So it's almost like you're replacing the restaurant demand and, and you know, putting it in the stores. And I think, I think uh, this one is just an example of clearly there's demand here because look at how many shares are kind of creating this volume shelf here. And, um, you know, so that is one that uh, looks interesting on the weekly uh, the daily, you do have um, kind of an interesting little case study from last week. Uh, this was a pretty obvious uh, channel here. I think a lot of people saw this. You also had the anchored VWAP here, which once we did finally, you know, break out of this resistance here, we pulled right back to test resistance. This was also an inverse head and shoulders that was forming. And then you did have the bounce right off the anchor view up. So this is a great example of using um, these things in confluence. A third variable in the confluence equation, you've got previous resistance acting as support. You've got the anchored view app from this March 23rd low. And you've got this big chunk of volume here acting as your point of control, which the price was able to bounce off hard right up to the next area of volume, which then acted as our area of supply up here right in the 47s. So uh, KO was a really cool one. Um, uh, I'm, I'm mentoring, so this is interesting. My mentor growing up uh, is my best friend's dad. He uh, was a, he's an, still an entrepreneur, a professor, um, teaches entrepreneurship at Duke. His son, my best friend's br little brother, now is starting to learn the markets and starting to learn about all this stuff. And so I'm mentoring him and teaching and, uh, he actually, I think, made 130% on this trade last week. Um, same thing with uh, um, my buddy Alex in Austin. They all got in this. I think it was, it was actually Alex's idea at first. And then once we saw the technical setup, I mean, it was just kind of like a, you know, just a one that you couldn't ignore. But uh, this, was, this was an interesting one last week. Uh, they all made, I think, over 100% on the calls. Uh, so a shout out to Alex for originally um, looking at this as a trade idea. And then the uh, the technicals just really backed it up and you had that nice gap up. So um, that is Coca-Cola. And then we'll go into GLD to finish this off. Um, and GLD is a really interesting one. Um, I'm actually in this one. I'm trading. Uh, I'm not really trading it. I, I bought into the 175 calls. A lot of the time I'll just buy some calls about a month out. And I'll just let I'll I'll try to let the the uh, plan just go through. A lot of the time with with options, you have to scale in and not be as aggressive as uh, the way I enter. Sometimes I'm used to buying common stock in large blocks, so it kind of just you know that that scaling approach with options kind of always gets me sometimes. But um, I'm I'm holding the June nineteenth one seventy fives. I'm down like literally eighty percent on them or something. But the beautiful thing about options is you only need to have two or three days of moves up and look at how, I mean, out of anything, gold and silver and all these other metals, they like to gap up because there is stuff that happens overnight that moves, that moves precious metals. And so you've got these gap ups and you can easily be from, go from being down 80% to being up 300%. I mean, uh, if you guys were checking out the video last week, Austin, my buddy who I'm, I'm helping mentor, um, he bought in at 135. The options went down to 45 cents. 
Um, he was about to sell him. Instead, he held and then scaled in, I think at 60 and 70 cents or something, lowered his average cost to a dollar and two cents from 135. And then he sold him at 350. So, um, you know, just because you're down on options, yes, it's, it's, you know, people have to have their rules, but there have been a lot of times where I've been down and just sitting through it and honestly, sometimes forgetting about the position and not selling it unless the, the plan has changed or you're just, you're getting close to expiration. You know, sometimes you can see those options absolutely explode. So just a real life example here, honestly, the reason why I'm in this position is due to this big volume shelf. If you look at that GLD monthly chart, I mean, you've got this massive rounded bottom forming um, and uh, you know, can we get just a, a mo impulse move up to 175 to 180? We did have it back in the day here. So if we do uh, highlight this zone right here or these two candles, you know, th there have been very big impulse moves up. I mean, gold, especially in a time where we're just pretty much handing out money is, is something that moves up. And a lot of people think that gold is, is a hedge against the market, but I mean, if you were in the markets in 2008 and you bought gold as a hedge, you, your, your gold went down with everything else. When gold broke out, when the stimulus kicked in, when money started essentially going into the economy, just being printed. And so we're essentially printing money again. We just broke out of this. Uh, so notice here, we broke out of this uh, area here. In, in 2009, pretty much when the recession was over. And here, we just broke out of this area here. And uh, we're not, uh, yes, we are in a recession. If you look at the GDP numbers, at least uh, we're, we're about there. I mean, you need your, your rules, like what is it? Two or three quarters in a row of, of declining GDP, or uh, I can't remember the, the uh, definition off the top of my head, but um, this is, this is literally the time when gold starts to rocket, when the money supply is just being absolutely, I mean, just, I mean, how much has it gone up? I don't know the exact numbers, but if you just look at the chart from the money supply increase versus 2008, 2009 to the last three months, it's, it's honestly fascinating and uh, just kind of questionable how that's possible. Um, without something happening or some type of re, uh, repercussions for this. So um, that is all for today. We, uh, we went for about 75 minutes and I, that's probably enough time for everybody. I could keep talking, but um, you know, we will keep posting charts, um, static charts on our Twitter feed and uh, you can check those out. But these were some of the main charts that we want to go over. Thank you those. Uh, to those that did request some charts. These were great examples to go over. And um, I hope everybody has a great Saturday and uh, has a nice relaxing Sunday. Sale. And, uh, oh, duh. So for uh, those that are interested who have not signed up for TrendSpider yet, I did want to mention that this is the last day of our Memorial Day sale uh, until 11.59 Central Time uh, tonight. 35% off any plan that we do have available. So uh, whether that's monthly or annual, you can sign up for the sale just through our website, going to trendspire.com and we have it um, posted on the homepage and you can go to the pricing plans and see um, what those different prices are with the sale discount. And uh, we really appreciate you tuning in today. Thank you all for those that are already customers and checking this out to see how to use the platform more. And thank you to those that are checking this out that are not customers yet, um, who are trying to figure out if this could possibly give you an edge. If you have any questions, let us know and we're happy to answer them either through Twitter direct message or through hello at trendspider.com. And uh, once again, that sale for 35% off either monthly or annual is going on until tonight at 1159 Central Time. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Saturday, and uh, we'll see you next weekend.